thank you for having me here. Uh, my talk concerns the abstract objects, especially mathematical abstracta, and uh, um, the way, the sense in which we can gloss over the spatial temporality characterization um, in terms of communicability and in regard to reality. So, mathematical objects and their nature um, have always been an intriguing philosophical subject. See, before Ben Asaraf, his 1965 paper, nobody has even questioned whether a natural number is an object or not. I mean, um, that is a philosophical hinge, but and uh, even holding on to Ben Asser's challenge, we can still call mathematical entities objects. Pache, um, some identity problems that led to a fruitful scholarship in philosophy of mathematics, square, um, structuralism, and so on. Um, so mathematical entities, phenomena, and places in mathematical structures, and whatever you can refer to by words can be called objects. That should be pretty obvious. And so we take this notion of object very primitively as it should be. Um, although there are objects, and there are indeed objects of our most rigorous science, these objects are not to be found in the real world. So like how Maddie will argue the set of eggs in the refrigerator. I think the set of egg, the set of the set of eggs in the refrigerator is just the concurrence of ontologically impartial wave functions, let's say, and not mathematical sets. I'm saying what we perceive in the real world as mathematical object, as a mathematical object, is never the mathematical object itself. Um, like, but it is it is an interpretation of a sense data in terms of mathematics. Um, that is, um, mathematical objects are abstract, and that's how they are taken up by almost every scholar arguing for realism in mathematics. These objects, these mathematical abstract are extremely useful and they are involved in our best explanations of reality itself so um, it's not it's um, i mean it's no surprise that not only the question of the texture of being is illuminating in the debates of uh, realism in the philosophy of mathematics but more generally it is also like a paradigm case um, of investigating realism in general um, so, as I said, the standard characterization of abstract object is to state that they are non-spatial temporal. So, spatial temporality is in itself a problematic but cogent notion, I think. And the problem arises if we take them this, take this notion too literally. If we take this notion too literally, we face epistemological problems to the effect that. How is it that we can have knowledge of abstract objects, especially mathematical abstract art? Because you see, prima facie, they cannot be unreal. But then they're also not spatial temporal. And, um, and after all, according to our best sciences, all that there is should be located spatial temporally. Because of these complications, I think this characterization needs a gloss. In and of itself, the notion of spatial temporality in a in philosophy of mathematics um, shouldn't be confused with the interpretation of this notion in our current scientific theory, say general relativity or quantum mechanics. Instead, we can take the notion in a Kantian fashion, maybe even with a lower case k. That is, take the notion relative to a cognizer and further as a basic prerequisite of cognition, something that we cannot unlearn or fruitfully paraphrase. 
the non-spatial temporality rightly distinguishes between the ordinary tangible objects like this desk, this computer in front of me, and uh, and things like thoughts or notions or concepts or concepts such as beauty, morality, or um, or a fictional character or a mathematical object or a structure. So it is useful in this sense. The first, mm, uh, first criteria, first step to um, distinguish between these things that are very intuitively different. Um, Now, I think we are kind of the masters of the abstract objects, we human beings, we cognizers. Um, just like the laws of physics are the masters of concrete objects. So it is our thing, a cognizer relative thing. Abstract objects are never are never substantially situated in a unique point. They are they're always involved in a process of free interpretation and they should be understood as processes, I think. My idea is this. Abstract objects are the reference point of linguistic communication. That is that the result of the processes of communication between cognizers or even within a cognitive device, like within my brain or your brain, they are the destination of a cognitive drive that is guided by linguistic expressions. So this idea, uh, the idea of this characterization in terms of addresses, places, and destinations, and um, first, um, it came from, um, this naive natural tendency to, um, to distinguish between our inner mental world and the outer public world. I mean, our mind tries its best to, tries its best to represent the outer world, uh, what is objective there to its cognitive devices and to differentiate between its conceptual creativity like whatever thought that I can have, and the objective mind independent world, the thing that is publicly available to every cognizer of that share in certain abilities, certain mental abilities. So it, our brain tries to, our mind tries to differentiate between this objective mind independent world and our arbitrary thoughts and of course this differentiation is based on the assumption that there are other beings like us in the world however mm, there are objects that are publicly at hand and as soon as one is especially temporally present at a point in space time uh, he or she can have access to that object and there are things that are somehow locked in inside our minds and it is not clear how to define the access in terms of spatial temporal presence in an analogical way. The objects of this source are the abstract objects. Um, So while the objects of outer world are communicated through the physical space time, the medium of propagation of abstract object is language. <clears throat> and it is in this sense that they are non spatial temporal in the, in the sense that they are, they are never present in a space time uh, point. We can never pinpoint them in a, in a space time region. Um, so natural language fun function as an apparatus that makes the public access to the abstract possible. The abstract objects themselves are a thing that are the epistemological locus of our linguistic and symbolic explanation, something that is basically a cognitive ability or cognitive object, let's say, uh, that exists 
at an unreachable infinity, but like I'm talking analogically, but we can only approach it by linguistics, linguistic roots like idealization um, project that Ladislav Kvas has um, pursued in his paper, in 2019 paper. So I'm saying that the addresses of this object, this abstract object is communicated through language. Now, just like the way in which an address can lead to a location in a actual city, if there exists such a location and an address corresponding to that location, in the same way, the corresponding cognitive ability or process or phenomena or whatever for an abstract object should exist in the first place, um, then an address to that place can be given. So at least the ability should exist. That is somehow close to the um, kind of hardcore Platonism that Gudo had like, and he permitted and predicative definitions and so on, because he thought if this object exists, then we can um, define them in their own terms. Um, so the only thing that is communicated um, is the path that enables the cognitive recognition of these objects, not the object themselves. They are just some cognitive primitives. Although an abstract object can be something non-linguistic like a cognitive recognition or a sensation of want, all that can be communicated to another person can be paraphrased in a linguistic sequence. Thus, without laws of generality concerning mathematical abstract that we can you can assume that every mathematical abstractum is constituted of linguistic expressions. So, as, as I've said, the abstract concrete distinction is the first step towards distinguishing things that are real and those that are not. I've mentioned this in, in, in the intuition regarding the outer inner worlds. Of course, necessarily every concrete object is real, but we cannot just deny the, uh, the reality of abstract object based on the fact that they do not occupy space time in the same way an ordinary object does. Arguably, the ordinary concrete objects are the exemplars of the utter reality. In the same way, I propose that basic mathematical objects are the exemplars of our inner reality and not other abstract objects. They are so because the knowledge of these sorts of objects can be easily ascertained with a few questions, anticipating similar responses from the, um, from the person you're asking question. Note that the answers in mathematics are normalized as much as possible, and that there is not much room for being spurious to look true, but being actually false. There are two points to bear in mind here because there are other abstract objects and mathematical objects are just one among them. I'm going to differentiate mathematical objects with these other objects. So firstly, I can also tell you a story and I can ascertain that you understood the story by asking you a question. Like who was Oblonsky? Who was this and that character in that novel? Um, but Mathematical objects are models of judgment, and they are much like a container rather than the content, while a story or work of fiction delivers content through the container of a fictional narrative. Mathematical objects are just the container themselves most of the time, like an algebraic structure. Other things can be put inside them and be reinterpreted in their terms. Secondly, um, moral or static judgments are also models or structures of judgments like mathematics. Yet we are not at all certain about what counts as a moral st or static. One can argue that even in mathematics, in the case of non-standard models and uh, non-classical logic, we, we are facing the same level of uncertainty if mathematics simplister exists, which uh, which is not something clear, but maybe a more pluralistic point of view can be taken up for now to allow for consistency to replace 
the disputed overarching mathematical simplicity, mathematics simplicity. Um, so another point would be that in ethics, for instance, by subscribing to a rigorous religion, like this or that religion, we can have sufficient certainty regarding the morality of our deeds as if. But I think for now, I can leave this case assuming that the level of certainty in mathematics is categorically different, or at least of a much higher degree. For one reason, because definitions in mathematics are existential operators. If we take Quine's view, at least intrinsically. The objects of mathematics exist intersubjectively. That is, as soon as we start to speak, the basic mathematical objects start to get into focus. For, for a bunch of people that are um, that that live together. So um, it, the objects, the mathematical object exists in between them in between the discourse, in between the talk, in between the way of life. And um, I said, as soon as we in, begin to speak, we need to refer, we need to say something. Like, I really think that um, as soon as we refer, we start to refer to things, we are creating mental objects. We have begin our mathematical discourse because we have already a certain nothing, something and something else. If I am referring to an object, there should be a background and there should be object itself. And that object should be differentiated from, be differentiated from something else. And that's like zero, one, two, and so on. And, um, and we can have integers if, our cognitive faculties allows for something like a successor function. And then the rest of mathematics can be defined analogically and by assuming certain axioms. The objects of mathematics are cognitively natural, I think, unlike, um, for instance, um, even notions like beauty and so on. They are very basic abilities that we need if we are to live and we are to speak and we are to communicate. We can do without statics, we can do even without morality, but we cannot do without the proto-arithmetical objects and structures. Because you see, we can quickly teach the basic numerosity to any child and even those languages that do not have um, natural um, numbers embedded in them, they have a sense of quantification. Without quantification, nothing is possible, no thinking is possible. And we can, so we can teach this um, concept to a child. And once the correspondence between the cognitive processes that recognizes successor function or, uh, or proto-arithmetical object, to a linguistic sequence like one, two, three, or an expression in a natural language, we can go on assuming that other people will reach the same conclusion based on the assumption that our cognitions are similar. So there are divergence, there are even in mathematics, which I claim is our most rigorous science. Uh, we have non standard models, we have intuitionistic uh, analysis, we have hating arithmetic, but I think the point can be uh, like all of these, all of them are mathematics and all of them are starting from, as I said, axioms. If you take certain axiom, then you can go on only in a one way or isomorphic ways. So, um, Regarding abstract objects, I think being real is a normative assertion. That's itself a substantial assumption, but um, I hope you can let me pass on with this assumption to with an allusion to Kuhn's uh, idea of paradigm shift in sciences. So assuming this, 
we can say that mathematical abstract that have already gone through a process of normalization by the mathematical community through textbooks, through teaching, through um, communities of mathematicians. We are normalized, mathematicians are normalized and certain linguistic sequences or symbolic expressions are complete are in a complete correspondence to our mathematical intuition if we also suppose that that exists in a sense in the very primitive sense that i said like natural numbers and channels and so on children and so on so um mathematics begins with recognizing simple proto arithmetical abilities that are shared among people and that those who focus on these abilities, which we call the mathematicians, these men and women, um, then form the, then, um, like chronicles, God created integer, this, from these um, God given integers, they produce um, that which is mathematics and is the work of men and women. Sorry, that's my 20 minutes but I will conclude shortly. So um, say one has understood the structure of a mathematical group and has succeeded in convincing another party that she does possess such an understanding by being able to utter the desired linguistic or symbolic responses to questions regarding groups. Then one has demonstrated the position of a natural uh, mental capability and does affirm the reality of its inner impression by the fact of demonstrating the common position of the same capability. Because we have already trained as mathematicians how to recognize what is true, what is false, which sequences now should be expected. If I'm talking about groups, what are the first basic examples like Z or so on? And so we know we, are, we know our ways in this regard. And if um, the abstract objects on discussion are this way generous arithmetical or geometric object like integers or even shapes like lines, straight lines or curved lines or triangles, reality itself is in debt to them. So if I am supposing that this place is real because shapes doesn't change because that rectangle stays a rectangle um that is because i have a intuition of a rectangle that it does not changes and as i said before thinking is impossible without a sort of quantification and uh, does a forte or apprehension of reality should be also impossible without mathematics so that's it. Okay, hope my mic works properly. Thank you, Hajir. Are there any questions? Yes, so Andre Weber, please. Um, yeah, thank you for the talk. Um, you emphasize the uh, connection between uh, abstract objects and our normal way of speaking. And um, I wonder whether this applies to uh, mathematical objects only, or whether you think that, for example, the meanings of our terms are also abstract objects. Uh, at, at one point you said uh, abstract objects e exist intersubjectively. At another point you said that with our terms we refer to or even create mental objects, which would mean that um, our meanings seem to be, well, uh, yeah, in our head, uh, but not in a way intersubjectively, because my mental objects are in my head, your mental objects are in your head, whereas abstract objects such as, as numbers seem to be different from mental objects in the way that they are um, intersubjectively uh, my uh, it's not that I have a number two in mind and you have a number two in mind and that are different objects but we seem to refer to the same number two uh, when we talk about it so uh, do you think that the uh, meanings of our expressions uh, 
are abstract as well? And does that mean that they are not mental entities? Or do you think that mental entities and abstract entities are somehow the same? And if yes, uh, how can they be intersubjectively? Um, okay, the, the part uh, where I think there are intersubjective, it is in this, it is in this sense. We, I assume, and I don't think my assumption is very uh, and a strange assumption that we share mental capabilities, okay? And these mental capabilities, they are the generators of, uh, some of them are the way in which we judge stuff, we think and we speak, okay? Like, like the language itself, there is, there is this natural tendency that we can speak this language and we can communicate a language because the the other person also shares the mental capability if not my computer would have understand understood me but my computer does not speak english and regarding um, the difference between the mathematical objects and why why they are inter subjective is because there are like proto arithmetical objects, one, two, three, like simple addition and so on. They are, we cannot do without them. They can be simply thought. Like I cannot simply teach you how to skateboard and I do not claim that skateboarding is a, mm, a kind of uh, intersubjective uh, ability that we possess. It's not a natural ability. It's something that requires lots of training and so on. But a child can, like, even there are claims that bees can recognize up to four and so on. So I think the the place in which they exist is some inaccessible mental capability that we call it. We try to get to through it to it via expressions and these expressions are abstract objects which can only be communicated as uh, as something abstract as something that actually does not exist in a space time and the point of our reference are not even the cognitive uh, the pattern of excitation of neurons or so on the abstract object is that which we can communicate by a means of communication to another cognizer, I think. I hope that answered your question. Okay, and another question from Brent, please. Yes, thank you. So when we look at a strawberry, it seems to have a redness quality. And in my talk, I argue that the redness quality is actually a quality of our knowledge of the strawberry or parcel in our head. And given that, would it be the case that this knowledge that has a redness quality seems to be concrete instead of abstract since the redness has causality, it causes us to say it is red and so on. Our knowledge of the strawberry has spatial temporal um, location when within our knowledge of the strawberry patch, for example. So is the knowledge of the strawberry that has an intrinsic redness quality in my head, abstract or a concrete parcel in inner reality? Just wondered your thoughts on any of that. So I think um, they are abstract, like mm, maybe how Hilbert thought about this will come illuminating. So he thought that Mm. For instance, mathem let me begin with mathematical and then we get to the red as the quality. And he thought that mathematical in one point of his career, he thought that mathematical objects are symbols in a sense that they represent, the, the symbol is concrete, it's something that we concretely write down on a paper in a computer. In that sense, it is concrete but yeah but what it refers to is abstract is that thing which we understand by the fact of um our cognitive abilities so even the redness the redness is not that even the redness is not the physical properties of the red that we understand through physics like this wavelength or so on 
It is that which we share between ourselves, that which can be taught and communicated by ways of examples. And uh, I think it's abstract. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.